Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy New Year and welcome to the first Sunday service of 2021. My name is David. And my name is Cheryl. And we are thankful to be able to host the service today. Cheryl, what are some things that you want to do in 2021? For this new year, I want to work hard and score well for my O-levels, as well as gain a deeper understanding of the Bible and my relationship with God. What about you? Well, I was moved by the lesson last week where Fahi talked about not just loving people, but more importantly, to grow more in with my relationship with God, that I want to experience God more through connecting and drawing strength from Him. What about you, brothers and sisters? Have you got something on your heart that you would like to do in 2021? We hope that you can share that with a close friend or with your small group so that we can pray and encourage one another towards the areas that which we want to grow together in. And before we start our service, our worship today with singing, I'd like to remind for us to prepare the communion elements if you have not done so, and for us to all go into prayer together with me now. Our Father in heaven, we praise and adore your name, O God. You are faithful throughout generations. You are merciful to everyone who turns to you. You love us without boundaries, and you reveal yourself when we seek after you with all our hearts. Thank you that we can gather before you on the first Sunday of a brand new year, while we were still in a celebratory mood a year ago. 2020 took a difficult turn, and we were faced with a pandemic. Challenges to our health, economy, the way we work, play, and live. Father, through these challenges, we may have become anxious about our future and gotten insecure. We may groan in our hearts, but we know that our way forward is to dig deeper into our relationship with you, to trust you and stay close to you so that we can hang on to your godliness. We pray that our hearts will be open to the direction by your Spirit this morning as we sing, hear your word, and give from and with our hearts. I pray that we will all grow in our love for you and strive towards glorifying you because you alone are worthy. We love you and pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I would like to read a scripture from Romans chapter 8, verses 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of our God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It would probably be easier for Paul to just tell the Romans in one sentence that nothing can separate us from the love of God. But he spells out that God's love for us goes beyond the extremes of comparison. This expands in our mind the love of God to us beyond imagination. As we sing the next song, Your Love is Extravagant, let's meditate on the goodness of God and be filled with His Spirit.
Today, we are going to have our sister Yuki from the campus ministry share her thoughts on communion. Yuki would like to share a passage with us from Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 30 from the AMP version. Not that I speak from any personal need, for I have learned to be content and self-sufficient through Christ, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or uneasy, regardless of my circumstances. I know how to get along and live humbly in difficult times. And I know also how to enjoy abundance and live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing life, whether well-fed or going hungry, whether having an abundance or being in need. I can do all things which He has called me to do through Him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill His purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything 
through Him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. So I think we can all agree that 2020 wasn't the year that we all envisioned it to be. Well, for me, 2020 was the exact opposite of what I envisioned my life, my year to be. And it was supposed to be the year where I graduated, had an internship with church, traveled, you know, and explored new things. Instead, I graduated with no grad ceremony and had my diploma mailed to me instead. And to be a fresh grad um, with little job opportunities. Right now, even my plans for 2021 are uncertain because of this pandemic. I have many fears and the feeling of uncertainty scares me a lot. And I wasn't contented with how my year was going and I felt like I deserved better and I deserved more. But throughout this year, I learned that there will always be uncertainties in life, pandemic or not. Um, and I asked myself, you know, am I just going to let these uncertainties deter me from doing great things or dreaming great, great dreams? Um, am I going to just live a life of discontentment because of the situation we are in right now? And the answer is no. Um, I do not want to live in fear, neither do I want to live a discontented, unjoyful life. So I turned to God in prayer and I stumbled onto this verse in Philippians a while later. And I think that it perfectly summarizes how I and all of us should look at the current situation. Paul was in jail when he wrote this letter to the church in Philippi. He was in jail being condemned for preaching God's word. He could have been so angry, he could have lost hope, he could have been in such discontentment. Yet he clearly wrote about how contented he was. You know, and here I am sleeping comfortably in my own bed, having loving parents who, you know, constantly love and feed me. Um, and such an amazing community around me to give me support. Yet I complain about being discontented. Truly, how dare I? These verses basically summarize that Jesus is sufficient and that he provides. Therefore, I lack nothing and I am sufficient through him. It is going to be a long journey, learning how to be contented in every situation. But for now, the promise that I am sufficient in Christ's sufficiency is enough for me to be contented about. So as we take the bread and the wine today, I hope that we can all be reminded about how we should be contented with the things that we have in our lives right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuki, for your sharing. I'm moved when she talked about how she was expecting a great year in 2020, but instead, so many things went south that through prayer and God's word, she found contentment back in Christ's love. For myself, just like many of us, 2020 has been difficult as well, especially in the last few months. As I reflected on what I needed to grow in, I was encouraged by the different moments where I heard from the word of God or through studying the Bible with people. And I want to be continually strengthened and empowered by God's Word. Let's go to God in thanksgiving as we partake the communion. Please join me in prayer. Our God, we come before you now to thank you for sacrificing Jesus on the cross so that we can come back into a relationship with you, to experience how deep your love is for us, and to draw strength from Jesus' suffering as we face our own challenges daily. Thank you for the bread that symbolizes his body and the fruit of the vine that symbolizes his blood, reminding us that we are now sufficient, not on our own, but in Christ. All this we pray in his name. Amen.
My name is Matt Brown. My wife Adriana and I lead the church in the Rio Grande Valley, Texas. We moved here in 2007. The church was about 50 members. In 2014, we, uh, we actually got to a point in our church building where we weren't fitting, and so we found a group, and they said, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll rent to you, we'll allow you to meet in our church building on Sunday afternoons. I got to know the minister of the church, the preacher of the church, Howard Bloomquist, a 73-year-old man, very loving man. In the, in the spring of 2015, I get a call from Howard saying, hey, can we get together, have coffee? I mean, I didn't really know, you know, what, what was going on, but again, we had built a friendship. He says, you know, Matt, um, I'm 73 years old and I want to retire. What if our two groups just kind of combine? Um, and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm floored. Um, I'm, I, just, I didn't expect that. I didn't see that coming. Uh, honestly, I didn't even know kind of how to answer. Went home, made, made calls, got advice. So in August, we decided, okay, yes, this seems like it's from God. Let's try to make this work. And Howard actually announced that he was going to be retiring. And we said, we would love for all of you to come be a part of RGV Christian Church. But we do want to be unified. So we ask that you go through our membership process. You know, talk about we're going to teach the same thing so we can all really bring glory to God together. My wife and I began to study the Bible with Howard's son, Kirk, and his wife, Essie. And they actually had done a lot of the work in the church, even though they worked full-time jobs. And honestly, we were just amazed by their heart and started talking about what the Bible teaches. Kirk felt some things and he would stop. There's two times I remember where he would say, hold on, what, what are you guys saying? Are you guys saying that, that my conversion wasn't valid, that I need to be baptized? And, and our response was always, no, Kirk, I mean, that's, that's between you and God. If you feel like you're, you're good uh, with, with your conversion, uh, man, we're just excited to have you be a part of things, but you do have to make sure that you're ready to meet God on His terms. And so in January of 2016, at a midweek service, Kirk pulls me aside and he says, I've been marinating these scriptures, I've been going over and wrestling with God, and uh, I've come to the conclusion that I, I need to get baptized. I was floored. I, I just I, I didn't expect that. A lot of the scriptures were just speaking to me, and, and I was reflecting on my life. He just tells me that, you know, for the past few months, God has been waking me up at 2.30 in the morning, and I would come to this exact spot here in my living room, um, and get on my knees and just pray to God, like, wow, if I not been doing this right. And then that's when I made that decision to say, Matt, I've got, I need to get baptized. Our next midweek service, we got to see both Kirk and his wife baptized. Uh, they have uh, become some of the leaders in the church. There's actually five different couples that they have been instrumental in helping to become Christians in the past two years. My brother and his wife made that decision to get baptized as well. So in addition to all this fruit, uh, we also have a place to meet. Uh, so they've given us their church building and we have this incredible property. Uh, in, the, in the last three, four years, the Lord has continued to bless the congregation in, in a marvelous way. And so many young couples and young couples that are reaching out to other young couples. You know, when my wife and I moved here, we could see the church growing. We could imagine seeing, you know, a campus ministry built. We could, we could imagine fruit, but, but honestly this, and the way it's all come together uh, to find an Apollos-like story, this has been something just beyond anything I could have asked or imagined. And, and just as a church, we're so grateful to have seen it. Wow, what an awesome story of God doing immeasurably more. I hope that it has encouraged you as it has for me. Are you excited for the first sermon of the new year? Today, we have Uncle Chen Yang and Auntie Yvette who will be teaching a great lesson from the Bible. Good morning, brothers, sisters and friends. Happy New Year 2021. For many of us, how we start this year and how we started last year 2020 was quite different. There were a lot of unanswered questions back at the start of 2020 when we just heard about the virus overseas. And then we got the news that Singapore registered the first case on 23rd Jan, 2020. Following that, Doscon Orange was declared on 7th Feb. I remember it was a Friday evening announcement. I was in the church conference room together with some overseas disciples from Ukraine. After confirming that it was not fake news, we then proceed to cancel our Youth Being Week two hours before it starts. And since then, 
we had to practice our discipleship, worship, and fellowship differently. I thank God that different families in church have been kept safe so far. It's also amazing to see different ministries tapping into the power of online video meeting to continue to stay connected and to reach out to our friends. Many of the young teens and teens had to have their Bible studies online over Zoom. The various youth mentors had tried their best to stay connected with the youth. The digital team and our worship team in church learned about the ways to improve on recording techniques. Even I am speaking into the future as I record this message last year, which is five days ago. We are blessed that we are able to tap into the power of technology infrastructure in Singapore. It will be a very different story if the same pandemic has spread with the same speed 20 years ago when we only had dial-up modems that transmit, transmit information over telephone lines. A device that was phased out in Singapore before the teens in church were even born. Right now, according to UCLA, an internet speed testing company, Singapore actually has the fastest average broadband speed in the world. There is so much power in a fiber cable to push information across this tiny island and overseas to connect us remotely. But as a community of Christians, what is the power that connects us together remotely? To whom are we connected to? Like, really connected to so that we can continue this journey of faith. The church ministry staff discussed and prayed and decided as a whole that the church team for 2021 will be the power of Christ. Taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We start our spiritual journey by the power of Christ. We can only continue this journey relying on the power of Christ and God promised us that we will end the journey secured in the power of Christ. Today, the title of my sermon is Experiencing the Power of Christ. We will look into an encounter as Jesus performed one of his earliest miracles in public when he healed the paralytic. It is probably one of the better known healing done by Jesus because it also involved four good friends. As I study out this miracle, it seems to be an epitome of Jesus' earthly ministry, a concise summary of his mission and a pattern of Jesus displaying his power throughout his ministry. Though it is better uh, being recorded in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we will read from Mark's account in chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It reads, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that it was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even a door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bring to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Let's pause here for a while. Jesus' supposed treatment seems to be a mismatch of paralytic's need at the moment, which was to have his legs healed miraculously by Jesus. My first point is experiencing Jesus' power to forgive. Let's rewind a bit, like in the movie, and take a look at the effort the paralytic put in to get to this point. According to Mark and other gospel writers, Jesus had been traveling around Galilee proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of God, healing the sick, exercising demons, and teaching the truth. He did this both in private residences and also in public synagogues. We can say that there was a bus in town when Jesus entered, and people literally were coming to Jesus from different directions. No need for social distancing. This particular house was packed to the capacity. They spilled out into the doorway which was the only entrance to the house. Some would probably need to be to peek through the windows or sit on someone's shoulder. They would probably be jostling for a good position. And I would imagine that when Jesus started to preach, everyone would be silent so that those who are standing outside the house could try to strain their ears to catch some of the words spoken by him. In the midst of the silence, come these four men carrying their paralyzed friend, having heard that Jesus might be able to help him. As a paralytic, he probably also bore societal stigma. Ancient Israel society associate paralytics to grave sins in their lives and they were receiving their due punishment. The paralytic must have felt uncomfortable being paraded around like this in public. But he knew that his friends meant well. The friends were determined to get their paralyzed friends to Jesus. 
when they saw the crowd, they could have turned around and maybe come back another day and say, maybe it's just not God's will. But no, these four friends, they were determined. They are on a mission and their love for their friends make them find alternatives. Even unconventional one who get to Jesus by digging through the flat mat roof. They know that paralytic's friends can never get to Jesus without their help. They are willing to be misunderstood by the crowd and be ridiculed for their effort, their bold actions. And the silent crowd would have felt dirt falling from the ceilings and quickly a hole would get bigger and bigger until it's big enough for a man to be lowered into the room. And here, the paralytic man finally came face to face with Jesus. After going through all the physical discomfort and the emotional struggle of being stared at by the crowd, he may just want Jesus to quickly heal his legs so they can leave the limelight and the shouting from the crowds for disrupting them from hearing the lesson from Jesus. Jesus, however, was not disturbed by the interruption. But what he said shocked the people present, including the four good friends and the paralytic himself. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. I'm almost quite sure that no one was expecting that at all. Maybe the paralytic man would have expected some sort of basic diagnosis, like how long have you been paralyzed? Or what would you like me to do for you? But definitely not forgiveness. The four sweaty and exhausted friends would also be scratching their heads and in a state of confusion. All the effort they put in to see their friends get healed by Jesus, but Jesus' words of forgiveness is so far from what they had in mind. This was the first instance in the New Testament that recorded Jesus declaring a person to be forgiven. After this encounter, there will be others also, but this will be the first instance. Why would Jesus talk about spiritual issue when this paradigm clearly had a physical issue that needed attention now? My thought is that it was a matter of priority. Although the paralyzed legs were a concern to Jesus, it wasn't the topmost concern. Forgiveness from sin was Jesus' topmost priority. Even if Jesus healed the man's leg, it would only last him a few decades. To Jesus, it was a meaningless if an eternal problem of sin still remained in the man. Jesus looked beyond the physical paralysis of this man to a spiritual paralysis caused by the various sin in his life. Someone said, life is like a $1 coin in your pocket. You are free to spend it in any other way, to buy anything, but you can only spend it once. Do we have the same priority as that of our Savior, Jesus Christ? Life has many demands and we all have different needs. If given a chance to meet Jesus, we might want to list out all our needs and to get Jesus to solve and help us in our immediate problems. It can be financial issue. It can be a sense of insecurity brought about the pandemics. It can be relationship issues within the family that has been sapping your energy and joy. It can be anywhere. It can also be negative thoughts that we look at nicely, curated lives of other people on social media. I know so often that I myself give in to these temptations of focusing on my inadequacy. My priority in life can be so messed up. I need to realign my priority with Jesus' priority of forgiveness again and again. In our prayer, which area take up more airtime? Your request of a better life and your troubles to be removed or your quest of forgiveness of sins. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't bring our burden of Jesus in prayer, or that Jesus won't answer our prayers for help. But when we only go to Jesus to request for an easier or more comfortable life, we actually miss out on the opportunity to experience the power of Christ in forgiving our sins. When we live our days in keen awareness of our sins, and Jesus renewing power to forgive them daily, it matters what we are going through then we will be able to understand Paul's words in Philippians when he said that he has learned to be content in all circumstances, both good and bad. I'd like to remind us that on earth, Jesus demonstrated his power to forgive sins, not only in this case of paralytics, but also with the woman who washed his feet and also the thief on the cross. And after ascension, Jesus continues to have the power to forgive our sins today because of the shedding of His blood on the cross, which is offered to those who respond to the gospel and continues to strive to walk with God. The topmost priority of Jesus is for us to be forgiven and reconciled with God. Let us take the time to examine our lives, be bold to acknowledge the sins of our lives, and go to Jesus to experience His power to forgive sins. My second point is experiencing Jesus' power to confront our hearts. Let's continue reading from where we left off in verse 5. 
And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins were forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they that task question with themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytics, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man had authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Within the same occasions, we see a range of reactions and emotions from different groups of people. Previously, we already saw the determination of the four friends want to see their friends being saved. They recognize Jesus' hearts for the needy and Jesus' power to heal his friends. The second group of people are the scribes mentioned in verse 6. In Luke accounts, he also included the Pharisees. Quietly within their heart, they reasoned and accused Jesus of blasphemy because this was the first time that they hear someone proclaiming forgiveness. We know that at the end of Jesus' ministry, this was also the very charge that Jesus received from the chief priests. They held on to these accusations, starting from here, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, while witnessing the miracles of the healing of the paralytic man. Jesus could read the message going on inside their religious mind. And he asked them a very interesting question that probably caught them off guard. Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytics, your sins are forgiven, or rise and take up your bed and walk? The funny fact is that the Pharisees can do neither of them. And only Jesus was able to do both. He can do the invisible spiritual act of forgiveness and the physical, visible act of healing the paralytic instantly. Finally, the last group of people who were initially there just to listen to a lesson, but ended up witnessing something like this. And they saw, they never saw anything like this and it prompted them to glorify God even more. What is your reaction when you read the scriptures? When you read the accounts of biblical characters recorded in the Bible, either doing heroic acts of God or foolish acts that hurt their relationship with God. When you read the different Psalms, like what Samuel spoke about two weeks ago. When you read the different letters penned down by Paul and the other authors. What's your reactions? Sometimes we might feel encouraged by God's words and we would like to share with others because it resonated with our feelings and our thoughts at that moment. I know that many of us are already doing that through our chat group, encouraging one another. And I would like to encourage you to keep that up. But I would like to encourage you also to share with one another if the Bible stirred some uncomfortable feeling within you. Maybe the scriptures convicted you on some sins in your life. Maybe as you read the scriptures, you are reminded of some events or someone Maybe you felt taught to repent and grow in the particular areas of your character. I want you to encourage you to allow your heart to be confronted just like how Jesus confronted the hearts of the Pharisees. If you find the calling to be reconciled with someone, you will need to verbalize your thoughts in a humble manner because your brothers and sisters don't have the divine power of Jesus. As some, some of you are listening to this right now, you might be thinking to yourself, most of the time when I'm reading the scriptures, I don't really feel anything. I will even go on to say that even no reaction is a reaction. And you can ask ourselves, why? What is the Holy Spirit prompting me when my heart is not stirred by God's words anymore? Just like Jesus, the Holy Spirit has the same function of perceiving our hearts and prompting us as long as we are willing to be still and connect with God's words. The famous saying, a picture paints a thousand words. Does ring true to a certain extent. As humans, or at least for me, we tend to feel and respond more to an image or a photo than mere words or pages. Looking at beautiful sceneries, photos such as this, or even better, visiting places such as the mountains will help us to hear all of God more than simply reading the Bible. Sometimes we also relate easier to scenes we watch or a random photo we saw because 
we have to be, uh, because of that, we have to actually be mindful when we read the Bible and how to connect with that with our hearts. I like the challenge that Pauli gave last year when he talks about the fact that we need to see, strive to, strive to see the nature and the character of God when we read the Bible. When we know who God is, we will then know actually what we need and not what we think we need. At the end of the day, we are all striving as Christians to be more like Jesus. Our faith can only grow when we hear the word of Christ and mention in Romans 10, 17, which says that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. For our friends who are joining us, I'd like to leave you with this quote from Shalom Ash, a Polish Jewish writer who concluded this. Jesus Christ is to me the outstanding personality of all time, all history, both as a son of God and, and as son of man. Everything he ever said or did has value for us today. And that is something you can say of no other man, dead or alive. There is no easy middle ground to stroll upon. You either accept Jesus or reject him. Experiencing Jesus' power to confront our hearts isn't an easy thing to do. It is difficult and hard to deal with the deceitfulness of our own hearts. But unless we are willing to do so, we will not be able to experience Jesus' power to forgive us. Right now, I'd like my wife, Yvette, to share her thoughts on this lesson. One of the most joyful part of serving the youth ministry, for me, is the privilege to see the transformation that takes place when Christians allow the power of Christ to work in their lives. Do allow me to share some examples with you today. I have the opportunity to witness how understanding Jesus' power to forgive motivates youth to repent and make Jesus their Lord. I see the realizations these youth go through when they're confronted by the destructiveness of their sins and the extent of Jesus' love for them on the cross during their Bible studies. The Bible stories they've heard since they were in kids' kingdom finally made its way into their hearts as they let and felt Jesus' love for them. Making Jesus their Lord gave them the strength they need to fight against the strong influence of the world as they seek to find their identity in Christ rather than the number of likes on their social media accounts or how well they do in school. One of them I have the privilege to know is Diana Hui. I have got her permission to share. Now, Diana's parents, Simon and Melinda, are in our sister church in Jakarta. And Diana has been studying in Singapore since she was 13. Moving to a new country, joining in a new school and church can be a daunting task for anyone, especially a teen. Now, Diana has a share of adjustments and insecurities she had to face. Living in the West area, coming to church on Friday evenings after school were a challenge for her. At the start of 2020, Diana finally made a decision. She made a promise that she will no longer make half-hearted effort and will instead give her best to seek God. Soon after she made this decision, the circuit breaker measures kick in. Now this could have derailed her plans as it's actually harder to bond with the community and easier to simply leave her relationship with God at where it's at. However, Diana continued with her Bible studies with her mentor, Sheila, online. And when I asked her what motivates her to do so, she simply replied that Jesus had gone through so much on the cross for her and that she realized how much she needs God in her life. Diana was the first baptism many of us witnessed via Zoom on 25th April and is still continuing to grow in her walk with God. I have seen many youths who have grown up in this church make their faith in Jesus their own rather than to borrow their parents' faith. Truly, there is transformative power when we acknowledge Jesus' power to forgive sins. I have also seen the power of Christ work in the families in church, how it can transform families, even when there are tensions in the family dynamics. When family members are able to take ownership of their own actions and allow Jesus to confront their hearts instead of finding the person to blame, relationships get reconciled. Families no longer switch issues under the carpet or make do with superficial conversations, but are willing to talk about hard issues and mend broken relationships. When each member chooses to focus on Jesus' love in forgiving them, parents are able to keep on loving their children when things got tough 
and you are able to forgive their parents because no one is perfect. All these changes are only possible because of the power of Christ. Lastly, the power of Christ is also evident in the faith and love I have seen in our youth mentors. Like many of us, youth mentors have their own life situations to handle. Aging parents, demanding jobs, responsibilities of children and ensuring financial stability. Even before serving as youth mentors, many of them have already given and served many years in building up God's church. It would be understandable if they would like to take the time to focus on their own needs and lives. Yet, they make the decision to continue building God's church through investing in the next generation. Be it helping the youth build a solid foundation and love for God in the preteens ministry, or studying the Bible and taking care of our young disciples in the young teens and teens ministry, these mentors strive to leave out Paul's words to the Philippians. To live is Christ, to die is gain. There's so much I can share about our youth mentors and their hearts. But one common thing the mentors have shared with me on why they are still serving is how through helping the youth, they too are reminded of how God has forgiven them and has helped them on their spiritual journey. Now, the examples I've shared today is not to boast about the youth ministry, but to highlight the power of Christ in the life of many brothers and sisters around us. These disciples are not superhumans able to do great things, but rather faithful disciples who make putting Jesus' forgiveness as their top priority in their life. Ordinary disciples who make regular time to allow Jesus to confront their hearts. Let us imitate their faith. And just like the people who were listening to Jesus reply to the paralytic man, give glory to God. Thank you. Thank you, Yvette. Just like what Yvette shared, God wants you to also experience the same power of forgiveness that changed the lives of so many people within the pages of Bible and also in history. In fact, many of the lives within church community are at the moment being changed by Christ's power of forgiveness. And I want my children, Ashley and Nathan, to also understand and experience God's forgiveness either through the scriptures or through my life. We are all on this journey together to know God and make Him known. Indeed, there is so much to learn and put into practice in order for us to understand the power of Christ. But I'm glad that I have you with me on this journey together. We will be able to appreciate at an emotional level Christ's power of forgiveness and also His power to perceive our hearts through the Holy Spirit and God's words. Thank you and may God continue to bless you in this new year of 2021. Thank you, Uncle Chen Yang, for the lesson. It was a great one and I learned so much from it. One of the things I learned is the importance of Jesus forgiving our sins over physically healing us because our life on earth is only temporary, but a life after death is forever. This helped me to realize that I often ask for a comfortable and easy life more than the forgiveness of my sins, which made me lose hope easily in tough times. I also learned about how the reactions that we have in lessons and Bible readings are so crucial to our relationship with God and that we should share any reaction we have, no matter how significant it might be, as it can help us to bridge gaps between God and fellow disciples. Right now, it's time to take up the contribution for the poor. On the screen, you will see the chart to which your donations will be used. Thank you.
Before we end our service today, we would like to close up with some announcements. As our usual practice of starting the new year and setting the direction for the, us all together as a church, we will have a workshop from the 15th to the 17th of January. The theme of our church this year is the power of Christ. We look forward to a time of learning and empowerment from the Word of God. If you are joining us for the first time, or have been joining us but have not had a chance to join a small group in our church, we would like to encourage you to check out one of them and make more new friends and grow together in God. You can do that by scanning the QR code on the screen to let us know a bit more about yourself and we will connect you with a group soon. That is all we have for today. Thank you for joining us. We will see you again next week. Take care and God bless. Thank you.